this lecture will be a presentation of a paper that I wrote long ago and presented at the first international symposium on Chinese painting that was held in China, the one, in, the one on Anhui School, or Huangshan School painting, uh, that was held in Hefei in 1984. For reasons that I'll relate, the paper caused quite a sensation. It was published in a Shanghai art journal called Duoyun in 1985, but for whatever reason, it was never published in English, and it's been inaccessible to English reading students and scholars. Part of the problem has been the number of reproductions required to really back up my argument. But the video lecture medium allows more or less unlimited illustration, and I'll take advantage of that uh, unlimited illustration by showing also a few images of real Huangshan scenery for comparisons. I'll also expand on that old paper to show other works by Hungren and talk about him uh, as a major artist of the Anhui School and as one of the great early Qing individualists. First image, please. By the late 1970s, my grad students and I were seriously trying to understand the importance of local schools in Chinese painting and also the economics of style, why certain ways of painting came to be associated both with socioeconomic forces and with regional schools in China. Next. The seminar I gave in spring of 1980, which included such future luminaries in the field as Ginger Xu, Scarlett Zhang, Jane Debevoise, Hiro Kobayashi, Judy Andrews, wow, uh, probed deep into these issues with some help from my history department colleague, Fred Wakeman, and his students, who filled us in on, for instance, the power and the spread of the Anhui or Huizhou merchants over the whole Jiangnan region, a very important economic phenomenon of the time. The resulting exhibition in its catalog, titled Shadows of Mount Huang, Chinese Painting and Printing of the Anhui School, was shown also in an East Coast venue, but mainly in our Berkeley Art Museum, it aroused a lot of attention. Jonathan Spence, Yale University famous history professor, praised it in a long footnote to a New York Review of Books article, for one. First slide, please. The historian and my friend Joseph McDermott, seen here with his wife Hiroko and Howard Marianne Rogers, was assigned to a, a study year in the Anhui capital at Hefei. He had wanted to go to Beijing, but the Chinese sent him to Hefei for his study year. He took copies of our catalog with him and gave them to museum people and others there, among whom they caused an even bigger stir. A, a group of foreign scholars devotes this much study and publicity, more than we have done, to our local school of artists. Wow. The outcome was the first international symposium on Chinese painting to be held in China on the Anhui or Huangshan or Huizhou School of Painting held in Hefei in May 1984, with an exhibition at the Anhui Provincial Museum there, drawing on collections all over China. This photo shows some of the distinguished participants. Dick Edwards was there, Zhu Jing Li, Bill Wu, Jonathan Hay, who was then still a grad student in China, as well as distinguished Chinese scholars, such as Wang Shuqing and Xu Bangda, as I say, not in this photo. And as the originator of the event and the special honored guest, I was asked to speak to the whole group at the opening session on the first evening. Next. I had decided to do something radical and unexpected, which needs a word of explanation. I had prepared an unchallenging slideshow of Anhui School paintings in U.S. collections, ready to give, but I decided to present instead my challenging, even explosive paper through an interpreter. That was Lin Xiaoping. And I illustrated it with double slide projection in a way they weren't used to. My argument, which I backed up richly with these images, uh, a mode of presentation that was new to most of the Chinese participants, my argument was that the famous album of 70 scenes of Huangshan, supposed to be by the central artist of the school, Hong Ran, a treasure of the Beijing Palace Museum, of which the director Yang Bao Da and the curator Xu Bang Da were both present, that this album was not by Hung Ran at all, but by his less famous contemporary Xiao Yun Sung. I'm showing two leaves of the album just to have something on screen. Next, please. Why did I decide to give this paper? In the years preceding, 
Notable Chinese connoisseurs such as Xu Bangda and Xie Zhi Liu, seen here in photos of them, had come to the U.S. and toured U.S. museums with their followers and had pronounced many of our greatest treasures to be fakes. I wanted to show the Chinese that we too could play at that game and do it on a sounder basis using visual comparisons with other works by the two artists, besides showing that the Hongran seals on the album didn't match those on others of his paintings, and so they didn't really support the attribution to him. I hardly need say that the paper caused a huge commotion, which continued through the three days of the symposium. Professor Keiho has challenged Chinese connoisseurship. My paper was the chief topic of discussion through the rest of the symposium. Jonathan Hay told me that I shouldn't have delivered it. It was insulting to the Chinese. That was his opinion. Well, I told him my reasons, but they didn't convince him. Xu Bangda talked with me privately in the garden during a break, telling me that he himself had always doubted the Hungran authorship of that album, but he couldn't say that publicly as a you know, curator at the Palace Museum that owned it. Next, Yang Bo Da, director of the Palace Museum in Beijing, which owned the album, and under whom Xu Bangda worked, reportedly marched Xu Bangda off to the Hefei Museum the next morning to look at the album with him, and made him deliver an impromptu talk before the whole body supporting the Hungran attribution. I was very sorry for Xu, as I watched him do this, obviously uncomfortable about it, not saying what he really believed. Next. Two more leaves from the album, just to fill the screen. I was approached after my paper by Lu Fusheng, editor of the Shanghai art journal Douyun, or Flowery Cloud, about publishing it in his journal, and I agreed. Like other Chinese publishers who wanted to publish lectures and papers by me, he turned out to want only the text and to care little or nothing about the pictures. He even lost the color slides I gave him for use in reproduction. But it did appear with a few illustrations as Lun Hongran Huangshan Tu Tzu Di Guiyu on the album of scenes of Huangshan attributed to Hongran in, as I say, in Douyun for 1985, number 9 with rejoinders by Xu Mengda and Shi Guofeng. Those were the two major Chinese art historians who had, who had to try to counter my argument in the symposium. Next. My paper opened like this. One of the most famous works of Anhui school of painting is the album of scenes of Huangshan with seals of Hongran. Actually, it is a set of seven albums of ten paintings each with an eighth album of inscriptions. So, 70 paintings plus inscriptions. These are two leaves. As works of the central artist of the Anhui school, depicting the central subject of the school, this is extremely important for our understanding of Anhui school painting. Also, it's the most complete early series of pictures of Huangshan that we have. Uh, it's been universally accepted as a genuine work of Hungran. However, I have long suspected that it was not really by him. And while living in Beijing in the fall of 1982, I had the chance to study nine leaves of the album in the originals on exhibition at the Palace Museum. This confirmed my earlier suspicions, based on reproductions, that the paintings were not by Hung Rand at all. Later, after climbing Huangshan and studying them some more, I came to a second conclusion, that they are by his older contemporary Xiao Yun Song. Today I'll try to show first that evidence for its being a work of Hung Ran is not reliable, and then that the evidence, stylistic evidence that is, for its being the work of Xiao Yun Song, on the contrary, is overwhelming. In saying this, I am not changing the quality or the importance of the album in any way. The paintings are unchanged. I am only trying to clear up the question of its authorship and give the proper credit to Xiao Yun Song. Next. The two artists had distinct styles. Here are two works by Hung Ran a great landscape titled The Coming of Autumn in the Honolulu Art Academy, and another one, a tall landscape formerly owned by C.C. C. Wong. These represent Hung Ran's style ideally. It's uh, linear, geometricized, usually without color. Hung Ran's main concerns as an artist are structural, how to create convincing and powerful effects of space and mass within the linear manner that the Anhui artists had adopted. Their reasons for that are too complex to be treated in this lecture. You can read our attempts to 
to find them in the Shadows of Mount Huang catalog, but they have to do with mm, a certain kind of appeal to the merchant class patrons, like Ni Zong, who these very spare, quiet, uh, dry paintings of the Yuan Dynasty came to be terribly popular among the rich people, everybody who wanted to own one. Okay, next. Those of you who watched the earlier lecture in this series on the paintings of the Yuan Dynasty master Huang Gongwang won't need to be told that in the former Xu Xi Wang painting, Hongran is following fairly closely a mode of constructing an ascending mountainside invented or developed by Huang Gongwang and used by many landscapists after that. Next. Typical works by Xiao Yun Sung, by contrast, use color. They contain figures. They are less structurally strong in composition. They retain more of the tradition of Wen Zhengming and other Sujo painters. And in mood and effect, they exhibit more of a kind of light whimsy, less of seriousness, even austerity, that Hung Ran represents. This is a section of a hand scroll by Xiao Yun Sung in the Los Angeles County Museum, dated 1669. Next. But the two artists were contemporaries. Working in the same place, it was natural that they would have points of style in common and even overlap in certain of their works. Hung Ran is said to have learned from Xiao Yun Sung. In later years, Xiao Yun Sung was, in turn, affected by Hung Ran's style. Xiao Yun Sung sometimes as in the painting in the Freer Gallery, dated 1658, seen here at left, sometimes moves into Hungaran's stylistic territory, and Hungaran sometimes uses some color, works with flatter forms, or otherwise comes closer to Xiao Yun Sung, as in this section of a hand scroll in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. So, how to distinguish them? If we try to question the attribution of some work ascribed to one of them and suggest it's really by the other one, on the basis of style, as I'm doing, someone can always reply, yes, but why couldn't Xiao Yun Sung have decided to do a painting in Hung Ran's manner, or Hung Ran and Xiao Yun Sung's? And of course, that is a possibility. Next. Let me use an analogy. Here are two works by the recent artists, Huang Bin Hong and Fu Baosher. They were contemporaries. They knew each other, sometimes working in the same place but they have individual distinctive styles. Now, if we found a work in the style of Fu Baosher, but with a seal of Huang Bin Hong, this could be a case in which Huang had deliberately worked in Fu's style. It's not likely, but it's theoretically possible. But we would have to be very sure that Huang's seal is reliable before accepting the paintings as by him. And this would be especially true if Huang's paintings had become much more admired and valuable than Fu's. In the case of Hung Ran and Xiao Yun Sung, Hung Ran's paintings have been much more valuable than Xiao Yun Sung's since their own time. So there was always a temptation to increase the value of a Xiao Yun Sung work by attributing it to Hung Ran. Next. The only real evidence for attributing the Beijing album of Huang Shan scenes to Hung Ran, apart from colophones, which can easily be switched from one album to another, the only evidence are the seals on the paintings, and these, as I will now try to show, are unreliable. Hung Ran seemed to have used at least two small, round seals, reading Hung Ran. Both are found on leaves of the album now on the Nelson Gallery in Kansas City, dated 1664, uh, his last dated work, painted only 13 days before his death. I will call these two seals Type A and Type B. In this one, Type A, the run character is written with vertical lines. Verticals predominate. In the other one, type B, the lines of the character are curved more to conform with the round shape of the seal. Next. A blurry image. I'm sorry, I don't have a better one. And the seal on the Beijing album of Huang Shan scenes doesn't agree with either of these. So far as I know, it cannot be matched with any seal on any other Hung Ran work. It seems midway between types A and B in design. The characters curve slightly, but not enough to conform with the round outline of the seal. Also, no, there is no other case known to me in which the same seal is put on every leaf of an album, 70 leaves that is, without moreover any inscription by the artist. So the seals are not reliable evidence for its being a work by Hung Run, and the inscriptions identifying him as an artist 
could, of course, be switched from one album to another uh, and may not have been attached to this album originally. Or they may have been written specially to attribute the album to Hungran to make it more valuable. Okay, next. The long inscription on f the four added leaves of the Beijing Huangshan album are written by Xiao Yunsung and dated to 1665. He praises the album as a work by Hungran. He says that he himself never went to Huangshan and he's now too old to go. But Hungran, he writes, since his return from Fujian, where he had gone during the Mingqing transition to escape the troubles, Hungran had been living among the peaks and cliffs of Huangshan, sleeping and eating among its seas of clouds and fog, and has absorbed all of these into his mind and his paintings. But I think it probable that Xiao Yunsung wrote this so that the album, really by himself, could be sold as a Hungran album for a higher price. So, the only real basis for deciding who, who painted it is style. And style, as I'll try to show, points strongly to Xiao Yunsung as the artist. I went on to show in my original paper a series of slides to demonstrate that the characteristic features of style to be shown in leaves of the Beijing album albums can be paralleled closely in Xiao Yunsung's works, but not in Hungran's. Uh, here I'll offer only a few examples. Next. Here is a leaf representing the Yungu Su, the Cloud Valley Temple, from the Beijing album uh, number five, that is the fifth in the series of seven albums. Uh, I expressed in this publication my gratitude to Mr. Yang Xin of the Palace Museum for information on the organization of the albums. Yang Xin at this time was in Berkeley, actually, for a year. Well, pointed peaks painted in the Mi style with horizontal dian and heavy clouds, as you see here. Now, Hung Run never attempted this style, to my knowledge. It's against the whole direction of his painting, of his style. Next. Xiao Yunsung, by contrast, did it several times. Here's a section of the hand scroll in the Venati collection, Lugano, Switzerland, dated 1663. And it's obviously the same peaks, the same clouds. Minor differences, but much closer than any correspondences we could find in works of other artists, and certainly not Hongran. Okay, next please. I should interject here that my friend Hong Zai Xin, seen in this photograph teaching his students at the University of Puget Sound near Seattle, where he teaches, told me that as a young student he attended this symposium, this was long before I met him of course, and he was impressed with my lecture, which was like none he had ever seen or heard. It was indeed a shocker, but he had no reason to be on either side to decide whether I was right or wrong. Next. From here on, I'm not going to be following my old paper or trying to identify the leaves of the Beijing Huangshan album as I show them. I'll simply show them and talk freely about them, always continuing my argument that they represent the style of Xiao Yunsung, not that of Hungran. This leaf, titled the White Sands Ridge or something like that, features an ascending zigzag path along the top of a ridge. These are often seen in works of the school. But this one, with its red robe figure and pictorial rather than structural handling of the ridge and trees, is very much uh, Xiao Yunsung's. Here is a section of a Xiao Yunsung hand scroll, doesn't matter where, that offers the same kind of diagonally ascending landmass and trees. My paper was made up of multiple comparisons of this kind. I wanted to drive in my basic argument so strongly as to leave little or no room for denying it. Next. This leaf, representing a pond called the oil pool, is a charmer with its small red robe figure in lower left gazing over the pond to the waterfall that feeds it. I must emphasize again, as I did in my talk, that changing the attribution of the leaves doesn't alter their quality in any way. They are very good Xiao Yun Sung's. But this artist seems to have little sense of feeling of the place, the sense of breathtaking grandeur that one gets when one goes to Huangshan. It gives, he gives us only these highly schematic versions of famous sites. The Beijing album now strikes me as the work of someone who has never been to Huangshan. An artist can transmit certain simple features of Huangshan scenery, but not the deep understanding that comes from long visual interaction with the real place. 
such as the shape of the rock oddly balanced on a rock platform, the Fei Lai Feng, the peak that came flying from album six. Uh, I put beside it a photo of the real place. The artist, that is, gives us the features that allow identification of the scenes, as in schematic pictures in a guidebook, but not the kind of representation that would be done by someone, as I say, who had been to the real place and really experienced this great scenery. Next. Another leaf with towering cliffs, a stream flowing below, and houses beside it. The rocky forms are somewhat geometricized, but not really organized into a strong structure, as Hongrun would have done. Next. And here is a section from a Xiao Yunsung hand scroll. Xiao inscribes it as being in the manner of Wang Meng, Huang Shan, Shan Xiao. Uh, in both paintings, he uses texture strokes on the earth forms and makes them twist. These belong to the Wang Meng manner as he used it. It was common for him to do paintings in the manners of old masters, a practice that was common in the early Qing period, as we saw in one of the previous lectures in this series. Hung Run very occasionally inscribed his paintings in this way, but much less often than Xiao Yunsung, and his borrowings from old styles affect his paintings less heavily. He's more his own master, following his own course, less affected by current or older practice. Okay, next. Here is another leaf, or part of one, with a man in a house by a waterfall, a conventional theme of a kind that Xiao painted more than Hung Run did. One's attention is drawn immediately to the man in the window, away from the landscape, that is, uh, which Hung Run would have emphasized. The simple, red-jacketed figures seen in so many of these leaves are most characteristic of Xiao's style. They are often faceless, or they have only dots for eyes and mouth. Such figures are never seen in Hung Run's paintings, which seldom have any figures at all. Next. Anyone who has climbed Huang Shan is familiar with the temples that are located at the base of the peaks, which make the landscape more accessible to monks and visitors. And here is one of them with its gateway and wall and two-story building with trees behind and around it. When we did the research for our seminar, we read a lot about the building of these temples and how they gradually opened Huang Shan to visitors by providing places where they could lodge. I later wrote about them in my article on pilgrimages to Huangshan, which is written for a symposium on pilgrimages, a book uh, edited by Susan Nakan and Yujun Fang. Next. A leaf with a natural bridge in front of a waterfall, based no doubt on a real place on Huangshan. Natural bridges were favorite subjects for Chinese artists, who sometimes depicted them with people crossing them. Next. And here is one with two waterfalls dropping down the cliff. These were to be seen on Huangshan after a rainy season. I was never there at such a time, and I never saw this many streams and waterfalls. A few of them maybe, but not that much. Not as many as appear in these leaves. Next. Here, for contrast, is a genuine leaf by Hungran from an album, if I remember right, an album in the Nelson Gallery. Next. This leaf features double peaks thrusting up diagonally above the clouds with small pine trees below to set the scale. But Xiao Yunsung cannot achieve real monumentality with his more easygoing drawing. Okay, next please. A photo of Huang Shan peaks taken from above as one begins the descent from the lodge shows slanting peaks, but also reveals the failure of Xiao Yunsung to capture any of the grandeur of the Huang Shan scenery. A Western artist would, of course, use sunlight and shadow and atmospheric effects to enhance the visual impact of his paintings. Chinese artists of this period mostly don't do that, but they have other ways of conveying the same sense of awe evoked by mountain scenery. Next. A leaf representing the Nine Dragon Falls, a famous place with a building on a nearby ledge reached by a road where viewers and visitors can rest and stay. The buildup of the mountainside at left somewhat answers to the multi-level waterfall, but in a repetitive, not a really dramatic or structural way. Next. The tallest and greatest peak at Huangshan is the Tendu Feng, or Heavenly Citadel Peak. 
and this is Xiao Yun Sung's depiction of it. I said in my paper that the album appeared to be the work of an artist who had never been to Huangshan and who got general configurations of peaks and scenes without capturing anything of structural power, the grandeur of them. Xiao Yun Sung had never been there, as I've said. Hung Ran had spent a lot of time there. And uh, this is subjective judgment, but it appears to be borne out by the nature of the paintings. Next. A photo of the two great peaks of Huangshan, the Lianhua Feng, or Lotus Peak, nearer at right, the Tendu Feng, further at left, a photo that gives some sense of their real look. Next. Xiao Yun Sung makes it look more like one of the lesser peaks. Here, the start to believe peak that one sees in middle distance over the trees as one ascends the stone steps from the Yungu Su toward the Beihai Lodge and one begins to believe in the Huangshan peaks. That's why it's called that. The great ones are still above and beyond. Next. A few more leaves, about which I haven't much to say. Here is one peak, loosely piled up, composed of green and blue and white flat forms, seen against a darkened sky. The leaves, as I continue saying, have their attractions, their charms, as long as we keep our expectations low about monumentality and adequacy for representing their subjects. Next. Another one with the main mass overhanging, a narrow road leads upward, and one of Xiao Yun Sung's red-coated figures is seen ascending it. Although the ascent is steep, there is no indication of stairs, none of the horizontal marks that would stand in for steps cut in the rock, which you find in other paintings. Next. Still another, featuring a small peak loosely piled up with pines growing from it. The peaks were properly named and described more fully in my original paper. I'm not attempting, as I've said, anything like that now. Again, the peak is neither plausible as a geological form nor powerful as an artistic form. It's simply piled up. Next. And here, in a black and white image, is the leaf representing the famous Fei Lai Feng, the peak that came flying a strangely leaning rock atop a stone platform. It's one of the memorable sights at Huangshan. Everyone who has been there remembers it and makes photos of it. Next. Here's a distant photo in which, appear, in which it appears in the upper left, already distinctive and instantly recognizable. And next. Here is a photo of it from a different angle and closer up. It appears in danger of falling over but it's somehow anchored solidly enough in its base that it stays there. Visitors with cameras are tempted to have themselves photographed leaning onto it, as if holding it up. Next. And here is that foreigner, Gao Zhu Han, who seldom failed to yield to temptations of this kind, as he was photographed by another member of the climbing party, holding up, indeed, the rock on the top of the Fei Lai Feng, with his broad sun hat in his other hand. Such photos bring back happy memories. Next. Before I leave the Huangshan albums, I want to show two leaves from a different Huangshan album, this one painted on silk, leaves that I myself acquired at auction and that I believe really are by Hung Run. I showed these and discussed them in my Hefei paper. I have no idea where they are now. Like all the paintings I owned over my many years, they've just been dispersed. Next. Hung Ron has written the titles on these, the names of the peaks that they de depict, and impressed a round seal, one of the genuine ones found also on others of his paintings. Next. The peak is constructed clearly out of geometricized forms. A recession takes us back step by step to the built-up peak. Next. The other one of the two leaves depicts the refining cinnabar peak where a certain Taoist is said to have carried out his alchemical work. It looms above the pines, reached by a recession, and is again constructed in the orderly way that we can expect of genuine Hung Ran paintings. Well, so much for this album. Now, a brief account of the aftermath of the symposium. Next. This photo, which I've shown before, near the beginning of the lecture and in other lectures, this photo was taken at Huangshan, I think, during our climb, and uh, I've named already the people in it. Jonathan Hay, as I said, who's seen here, is in the foreground. 
Jonathan told me I shouldn't have done this, that I tried to explain why I had. Anyway, next. Shu Bangda and I remained friends, in spite of the trouble that my paper and its aftermath had caused him. Takehiro Shindo, seen here at the right, was a close friend of mine for some years, coming often to the U.S. and to Berkeley, but then he died suddenly of an illness. Next. Jinwei Na, seen here, was the head of the art history program at the Central Academy of Art in Beijing. He had become more or less Mr. Art History in China. He was the one who hosted Zhu Jing Li while Li was in China for a year. He came to the U.S. He was in Berkeley for a time. I had to host him. Not one of my really favorite people. He turned up at all the symposia in China. He gave long talks about nothing in particular. And he was famous for stealing his students' work and publishing it as his own. Professors can do that in China. They're all powerful. There's no recourse. Next. Here we are, the group who made the trip after the symposium, making their way up the path to the tomb of Hungaran. We were taken there. You can see in this Takei Shindo, Michael and Quan Sullivan at the left, a famous old person, I can't remember his name, is being supported by others climbing up. Next, please. This is the objective of our pilgrimage, the tomb of Hungran. Uh, I had a photo, I can't find it now, of the group standing below the tomb, gazing up at it, thinking of appropriate things to say to each other. Next. We climbed Huangshan, stayed overnight up at the Beihai, but the second day, we could not stay at the lodge partway down, as one usually does. There was no space. So when we had to make the entire climb down in one day. We did it, but it was very hard on our legs. I had trouble walking for days afterwards. Next. Here's the two great peaks again, the Lianhua Feng and the Tian Du Feng. Some people on our group climbed both of them. Howard Rogers, I think, did. Up and down. I can't remember what I did, as much as I could manage anyway, and I was very tired for a long time afterwards. Next. Here you see the stairway cut into the rock and the railings. This was done first in the late Ming period, as I think I've said, and our essay on topographical painting in our catalog made a point about how depictions of Huangshan changed, made it look more accessible and climbable as time went on. In other words, the mountain didn't change except for uh, temples and so on being built there and steps, but the people thinking about it changed, so the pictures changed. That was a big point in our one of our essays. Next. I made photos partly to show the basis for the geometricized style, one of the factors behind the style, along with others, um, that is the, the geometric look of the, the mountains themselves, the, the sharp cut cliffs and so on. Naive people tend to say, artists painted that way because the scenery looked that way. But art historically sophisticated people uh, use a number of factors in accounting for style, not just that. Period, locale, social status, patronage, and so on. My book, The Painter's Practice, gives a lot of information on these matters. Uh, drawn from many sources by my seminar members and consolidated by me. So now I'll offer once more a quick account of how Hungran style evolved and how it relates to the scenery of Huangshan. I'll do this again more fully in a later lecture devoted especially to Hungran and other Anhui school artists, if I get around to making one. Next. The dry ink monochrome style used by Anhui artists as a group uh, was originated by the late Yuan master Nizan more than anyone else. Although, of course, he was preceded in this by a few others, notably Huang Gongwang. It was said in Nizan's time that the social standing of a Jiangnan family was determined by whether or not they owned a Nizan painting. He traveled about in his late years. He left his, his rich home. He started out as a rich guy. But he traveled around by boat and so on, staying with patrons, doing paint paintings for them to pay for his lodging and uh, whatever help he got. Uh, paintings that all look pretty much the same, really. And the same came to be true of the Anhui merchants. Owning paintings in this dry, outwardly unappealing style demonstrated their elevated taste in the uh, whatever of the time, the beliefs of the time. So they all wanted one to show how elevated their taste was. Next. Some of the would-be lofty-minded amateur artists of the late Ming used some version of the style. 
Here's a hand scroll by one of them, Li Ruhua. My seminar traced the parallels between where these artists worked and the places where the merchant culture flourished between sites in the Yangtze Delta region and the Anhui sites they came from and lived in. Next. Dong Chi Chang, as seen here in a powerful landscape painting by him, uh, which I reproduced in my Distant Mountains book, was especially influential in setting this taste and promoting this style among those who aimed at acquiring reputations for lofty taste in art. Dong Ji Chang moved around among these merchant class collectors, as we traced in our catalog essay. Next. A detail of the upper part of another landscape by Dong Ji Chang, one that was owned by C.C. Si Wang, which shows that this shows a painting was especially useful for showing his role in originating the spare, linear, geometricized style of the Anhui artists. Next. And here is an early work by Hung Run, showing how he was using this angular, linear manner from early on in his development as an artist. This is an early work. Uh, it's a mildly interesting but not very strong painting. Next. This is an old photograph of Huangshan Peaks, which was all we had for a while to demonstrate how they supply a kind of model for the angularity of much Anhui school landscape painting. But, as always, the style is mostly a matter of the artist's choice, which they make for a diversity of reasons. The naive notion, as I said, that artists simply painted what they saw, so the character of the scenery around them determined the character of their paintings, this should always be recognized as inadequate and misleading. Next. Then sometime in the 1650s, Hung Ron made a trip to Nanjing, and there, it would appear, he became acquainted with Northern Sung monumental landscape, which was, as we know, to be seen in collections there in Nanjing. I used to represent it, this detail from a landscape by the Northern Sung landscapist Yan Wan Gui, which I've shown in my old lectures, uh, which uses that distinctive way of representing landscape masses by showing their slanting upper surfaces turned toward us and one side, so as to bring out their volume. You see three sides of the thing, and therefore you understand its volume. I talked a lot about this in my lecture on Northern Sung Landscape in our first series, so I needn't do it in detail here. Next. Here is a reproduction of one leaf in an album of landscape sketches that Hung Ron painted in 1657, while he was in Nanjing, or shortly after his return. This argument I'm making, using these same images, is in the fifth chapter of my compelling image book, the Harvard Lecture Book, where you can read it and see the same pictures. Including the sketch I made to show more clearly and schematically this way of constructing a 3D mountain mass, I included it, that is, in my, uh, in my book, and here it is again. So then Hung Run, once having mastered this new mode of construction, new for him, goes on to use it to produce the painting that is acknowledged as his masterwork. Next. And here is the great hanging scroll in the Honolulu Academy of Arts titled The Coming of Autumn. He constructs it uh, as a northern Sung landscapist might do out of forms that are volumetric in this new way that I've just talked about. And he achieved the same kind of monumentality which viewers respond to at once. When we had this painting for only a few days in our Anhui School exhibition, it drew everybody's attention, drew it away from most of the others, and the reviewer for the San Francisco Chronicle reproduced it with his review. And of course, I've used this sequence of images numbers of times to make one of my favorite arguments and one that angers advocates of so-called avant-garde art and all the rest. My argument is, it's easy, I say, to be radical. Anybody can pick up the brush and paint a landscape that's all done in line and angular forms or whatever. And the lesser artists early in the Anhui school development do just that, but they don't produce great paintings. What's more difficult and ultimately far more rewarding is to adopt a radical mode and then use it to make good or great art, as Hung Run does. And I use lots of analogies of that kind. Next, please. I followed this up by reproducing a detail from the lower right of the Honolulu painting and suggesting how 
The possibility of spatial contradictions in drawing a form like this might have, and this is only imagination, might have provided for Hung Run the inspiration for one of his most amazing works, which I know only from an old reproduction. Next. This one, titled Landscape of Mount Wui. Mount Wui is a place in Fujian province, which was Wu Bin's birthplace and the site of his early activity. Um, uh, Hung Run, uh, well, you may have gone there anyway. What happens on the right side of this large form that dominates the picture, a recession from foreground to a middle ground summit, is contradicted by a vertical line like a cliff that connects the two uh, at the left in a way that doesn't allow recession. So you have a kind of spatial contradiction. This part of my argument about Hung Run was a great hit. Lots of people found it new and exciting. A young woman at some Midwestern college, I remember, wrote me about how she was developing it into a thesis topic. Next. But Hung Run also painted works in a style more derived from the Suzhou tradition of Wen Zheng Ming and others. A good example is this hand scroll in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, which he painted in 1471. Unfortunately, we were unable to borrow it for our exhibition. I forget what reason was given, but the Boston MFA has always been difficult about loans, as it is about showing works of art and storage to visitors, even qualified ones. That's another argument. In this, uh, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts follows a Boston tradition of a lofty disregard for the masses among the old family gentry class, a tradition that puts it at an opposite extreme from the Freer Gallery of Art. I, of course, was always on the Freer side, and this is in other ways. Next. In 1965, just as I was leaving the Freer to move to Berkeley, we bought this work by Hung Run, one that I supported, although it's unusual among Hung Run's works. He painted it, he writes in his inscription, while staying at the Yungu Su, the temple from which one typically begins one's ascent of the backside of Huangshan, so to speak. It isn't done in the angular, reduced, linear manner, but in a more painterly style, we might call it, more densely built-up surface of tree foliage and rock patterns. Next. A large painting in the Shanghai Museum representing a rocky cliff with pine trees atop it and growing out from it and distant peaks seen down below. Such a painting might have been hung at the entryway of a big house as an impressive showpiece. Next. Hung Run, like most other artists, responded to the wishes of his clientele and painted pictures to match their wishes and their needs. This one has a dedicatory inscription on it. A big part of the work of the text readers who dominate Chinese painting studies and it is identifying the people mentioned in inscriptions of this kind and trying to determine what part they played in the artist's life, whether the dedication indicates a date for the painting and so forth. Next. This was never a big part of my own research and contributions to the field. Other people did it better than I did, and they had access to sources that weren't accessible to me, even if I had wanted to explore them. I did pursue certain kinds of biographical research that seemed to me to shed light on the paintings. I remember getting with difficulty a rare piece of writing on Hung Run's life that was available only in a manuscript, uh, or a Xerox copy of one as we then made them. Next. Finally for this lecture, a Hung Run painting that is less spectacular than others I've shown, but fine and genuine in its way. It was my own for a long time. I bought it from the Hong Kong collector dealer J.D. Chun, Chun Rendao, for about $150, way, way back, and I kept it for many years. C.C. Wong was reluctant to believe it genuine for a time, and he balked at its inclusion in the special issue of Yuan Doyang devoted to my collection, but he finally changed his mind and accepted it, and it was included. It's inscribed by Hung Run as being in the manner of Lu Guang, a late Yuan master. But what he is really doing is using the constructive mode of landscape painting originated by Huang Gong Wang, which I showed and analyzed at great length in my lecture on him, the third in our series, I think. I won't show in detail how it's used here. You can do it for yourselves. But note the way that Hung Run achieves depth with tree groups of diminishing size. It's a strong and fine painting in the end. It was in the group that I gave to my daughter, Sarah, 
or rather one that she chose for her group when she and Nicholas, my son, made their choices from the group that I set aside for them. And recently, when Sarah felt that her family could use some additional funds to relieve her husband of some of his work so that he could devote himself more to making videos, she put this and two others she owned into an auction. It brought a big price. Well, that's been the only positive kind of financial activity I've ever engaged in. I'm hopeless at all other kinds of money making, and I never engaged in it deliberately and systematically as a dealer. I bought paintings when I liked them and could afford them, and I disposed of them only when I needed funds for buying more paintings or for other needs. And I hope that you will believe that because it's true. As I testify in ending this lecture, James Cahill finished at the end of January 2013. The end.